like it? Why did you do that? Scrape off your hair? In my world, when I left it, only kids your age wore beards. Beards? I don't go in for fads. Somehow, it makes you look less intelligent. This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1,926, Retro Movie Review, Planet of the Apes, 1968. Welcome to Comic Geek Speak. I'm Ian Levenstein. I'm Shane Kelly. I forget what order we were going in. Good heavens. It, well, I'm Adam Murdo. <laughs> and I'm Chris Eberly. All I know is Chris went last. <laughs> close enough. Close enough. Uh, behind the scenes, that's what happens when my father calls right before we're about to record. Everybody and was, forgets everything. <laughs> and I was too concerned about Captain Carrot. <laughs> that's a hell of a figure out there, Shane. That, yeah, that I, you know, really awesome figure. Yeah. I... I I have more McFarlane crap than I care to, and I was not going to get many more, but I'll tell you what, this Captain Carrot figure is awesome. Even the ears are articulated. <laughs> no, it's a great figure. I prefer, there's a version of this that's more of a classic look, and I wish that one was the one I had, but that's not the one they sent me just because it's random, so I'll take what I can get. And this is a new McFarlane classic, quote, classic Superman. He's actually smiling. Oh, um, Murr, there you go. A light colored mm -hmm. outfit, and it, it just, it looks like a vintage, like Christopher Reeve kind of It's a great Superman. figure. Mm -hmm. I go so like, far as to say George Reeves. Yeah, it, it just, it looks gorgeous. So I'm like, that's, if if he could do more crap like that, he'd be much happier. For, like, and for the good of the order, I have a Mego era Dr. Zayas. Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas. There you go, Murr. Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas. <laughs> Ah, uh, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, yes, it is indeed another retro movie review here, and one that's been a long time coming. We have ourselves the original Planet of the Apes. That's why I emphasize 1968. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, very good point. It's been done multiple times uh, to varying degrees of success, but uh, this is I'm the. I'm sure we'll discuss that as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah the, the 1968 one uh holds probably the uh the closest uh to excellent i think out of out of out of these I, although there's been a new series of movies that i've still yet to actually see uh, that's that's gotten very good critical acclaim they, they're quite good i've seen them all yeah but they're yeah. definitely their own thing that's yes, more, they are right that's a whole different mythology, whole different reality of Planet of the Apes, and uh, one of these days I'll get to it. They're up to like their sixth movie in that, if I remember correctly. Like there have been a lot of those at this point, either mm -hmm. five or six. That's about to be coming out soon. And each one creeps the world depicted closer to the world that we saw in the 1960s. Yes, that's right. But yep. but the, the first couple are, are more grounded in the book in that they're in modern times. Yes. Using yes. things. Well, we'll then... we'll talk about. Because I've read the book. We'll talk about read the, book. the book versus the movie and all that as we move along. Oh, absolutely. Because they're dramatically different. <laughs> yep. And and before we move along, uh, as usual, a reminder that uh, you folks out there in uh, podcasting land are uh, very, very important. And we thank you very much for any support that you give over at patreon.com slash comic geek speak. Uh, for as little as a dollar a month, you can support the show and our ongoing endeavors, whether it be the uh, the retro episodes, whether it be these episodes, whether it be in studio episodes. Uh, we keep uh, these wheels a turning because you are there to help us do so. And we thank you so much for any support that you happen to give. Uh, here, here. Donations are also available straight on the website via PayPal at comicyspeed.com slash donate.php. Um, and if you don't have money to give, uh, there's other ways to support the show, uh, whether it be just through, you know, sending a review, uh, commenting on the super group, or just, you know, spreading the word in one way or the other. Um, and now we've completed our 
social media sojourn, as I've been calling it. And uh, officially, after years where there's been a fake comic geek speak on Instagram that posted three times in French, uh, we, <laughs> we, we, we officially are on Instagram. So if you go to comic geek speak, all one word on Instagram, you will find the official account for CGS. I plan on posting some old photos there, uh, as well as announcements for new episodes now, uh, as, as they happen. How do you know that's not me? Parlez-vous français un peu? <laughs> hey, Shane, if it, if, it, if it was you, then, you know, by all means, man, you haven't posted in years. <laughs> I love when Shane gets frisky. <laughs> Comic underscore geek underscore speak was the imposter account. And uh, the last the last thing they posted was like a, a picture of Deadpool uh, entirely in French. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> oh, man. But uh, yeah, we're on Instagram, so check it out uh, if you haven't already done so. And we're also on Threads, uh, also Comic Geek Speak. Um, that may or may not get as much traction as any of the other ones, but uh, just parking ourselves there just in case, so you never know. Producer extraordinaire, folks. I do my best, my friend. I do my best. Onward! We go into the Planet of the Apes. Onward and upward. Yep. Uh, oh, okay, wait. Before we start with the Planet of the Apes, I know yes. I couldn't join the previews episode because I was too busy last week yes i did put my order in last night mm -hmm. and i did order that ape like monkey issue in dc comics special oh, that's going out there <laughs> special, yes. Yep. yes 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 and and i thought you know if we talk about that at some point i have such an aversion to how terrible jail ape was <laughs> that people might wonder why to order this he's still traumatized <laughs> the thing about this issue it's all established ape gorilla right it's, it's characters who are supposed to be apes yes that make perfect <laughs> sense so i'm quite excited and boy jamie would have loved that issue all I, that's all i could think of when i saw that is oh boy, jamie would have loved that issue yes indeed yep and we did we did point that out uh, on the previews episode itself as well that that episode that that issue would have 100 percent been yep. in oh. jamie's order yep oh boy no question about it <laughs> but a different type of apes and a whole planet of them uh Shane, so why don't we start with you? Uh, your your thoughts on uh, the OG Planet of the Apes? Well, I remember watching it a few times. I can't say it's like like what I watched Star Wars, but I have watched it a few times in my life. Um, it is very, very. What do I want to say? Very. very ahead of its time in a lot of ways from mm. when it was made i can see why it won awards for the effects the costumes um they were just spectacular i think it can be the story it can be a little silly in the 1968 version there is a lot of time when no one's talking at all you're just wandering around yeah, I love um, it. but that's okay uh it's it it's a great story it's a great film and and i enjoy it every time i watch it yeah it, it, it's it really is something special and you can see a lot of future sci-fi movies uh that they took a bunch of cues from the world building that happens inside of of this movie absolutely um, they had a great marketing scheme around planet of the apes when it was out if i remember reading right they had Dolls, toys, lunchboxes, you know, tons of stuff. Especially in the 70s as, as everything built steam. I mean, one of the reasons I think it's important to talk about this film is that we talk about the idea of merchandising tie-ins. It mm -hmm. really starts here. Yeah. With, with Even Planet before Lucas and Star Wars, which yeah. did a great job and catapulted it. But, boy, Planet of the Apes the merchandise was, was insane from what I've seen online. Oh yeah, and and also just the the style of the of the advertising. You know, th this is this is one of the original movie posters right here. Um, the, the the simplicity in it all, um, but it still gets the point across, um, even with a you know just a simple image of of you know the cages more than anything else. Um, really gets that point across. So, Murd, your 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 thoughts on Planet of the Apes? Okay. Uh, well, uh, for once, uh, the, the, this was not my first viewing of the movie we'll be reviewing. Um, this is one that uh, I saw for the first time as a child, I'm happy to say. Uh, this takes us back to some circa 1990, I guess. I remember I watched it on 
on VHS. <laughs> it's a, it's, you know, we, I was talking to Ian about this before we began recording. That they would have been my medium of choice to watch it this time, but uh, it wasn't available to me, so I had to go on Amazon Prime or uh, Amazon Primate, as we might <laughs> 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 appropriate to this discussion. Uh, but yeah, I was over at a, a cousin's house. Um, it was a, a family meeting of some kind, and I was set up down in the basement with uh, a video and a, a meal of some kind. And I'd read... I. I I used to check out books about uh, the classic uh, monster and sci-fi movies from my elementary library. And uh, so I already knew the, well, part of the big reveal of that uh, you know, it was Earth all along, that uh, the planet of the apes was our own planet. But I didn't know about uh, the way this, this reveal was uh, presented to, to, to the viewers, you know, the, the, the iconic scene of the, the, the ruins of the uh, Statue of Liberty there on the beach. But as I put in the videotape, you know, often videotapes in the old days had little promotional messages recorded under the beginnings of them before the movie began as, as like a commercial for other videos in a series. Mm -hmm. uh, they did that with this, and uh, that image, that scene was there in that promo. Oh, come on. <laughs> I, so I got that spoiled for me the very first time I saw it. Oh, I'm still... <laughs> incensed about it that seems um, weird but yeah so i that's I, I saw it for the first time as a kid of maybe 10 or 11 years old and uh, i've seen it maybe two more times in the intervening years and then saw it for what may, may be the fourth time in preparation for what we're going to do here so yes i've i've always regarded this movie fondly it's always been a thrill to watch uh so i was very happy to uh, revisit it at chris's behest uh, you know, it's one of those movies you get something a little different out of uh, the more times you watch it. And uh, the first time it was just uh, just a, a thrilling science fiction romp. You know, I, I enjoyed classic sci-fi fantasy adventure films of the 50s and 60s as a kid. And uh, this, you know, this <laughs> kind of falls into that territory. But it uh, yeah. breaks apart from that subgenre in a couple of critical ways, as I, I hope to point out as we go along here. And uh, I think this viewing, I came to enjoy it. As you know, you know, Shane mentioned, and rightly so, that it was ahead of its time in a number of ways. But uh, it's in other ways, it's very much a product of its time. Oh yeah, specifically, yeah, yeah. and it's it is the mid sixtiesness of it that I I find I, I've come to enjoy most of all. It's watching it, you, you really feel Rod Serling's influence because it feels in a lot of ways like a a very long and lavish episode of The Twilight Zone. Yeah. And, and in other ways, it kind of feels like an episode of Star Trek, which uh, with which it was contemporaneous, after all. Released yep. in 68, Star Trek was still on the air in those days. Yeah. So, yep, uh, you, you got to love the, the, the filming. You know, the costuming was great. You can see how it might have had a little bit of an influence on Star Wars later on, in fact. And just the prop design and, of course, the prosthetic makeup effects for which it won an Academy Award. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a longtime favorite of mine, and so I was happy to be able to... Trek back to the Planet of the Apes this one more time, and then just savor the uh, <laughs> the the mid '60s, you know, Cold War paranoia, and the, uh, <laughs> that 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 great scene that Ian played at the beginning, the uh, the uh, reaction to the youth counterculture. Yeah, and it's just yeah. I'm not into sads. <laughs> Great choice, Ian. That dialogue, looking around at the mostly hairy faces on this call alone, we can just see how spectacularly <laughs> that line has aged. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. I'll go next because piggybacking off of some of the things that uh, that you just said, Murd, uh, I wrote up a little piece. Consider, oh. if you will, a man. A man with two first names. He was sent deep into space on a mission of exploration, perfectly aware that when he returned, no one would remember who he was as time waits for no man. Suddenly, the man and his crew unexpectedly crash land in the middle of a Star Trek set. They are alone, <laughs> nothing around, with dwindling s supplies. But are they alone? No, they are not. In fact, they are very far from alone. For, you see, unbeknownst to them, and especially unbeknownst to the man with two names that are first names, this crew has been thrust into the Twilight Zone. And the Twilight Zone is full of apes. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah. <laughs> Levenstein, the creativity. Ooh. <laughs> I was inspired, man, because what watching this, knowing that Serling, you know, was one of the main men behind this, they could have very easily branded this as the first Twilight Zone movie and gotten away sure. with it. Um, it's it is 
very, very easily, as Murd said, a, a two hour long Twilight Zone episode. Um, and I mean, both in the pacing and the style, in the in the acting performances, um, it really gets the point across. And I I absolutely completely understand now why Planet of the Apes is regarded as the classic that it is, because yes, it is ahead of its time. Um, the world building in it, in and of itself, like for 1968, is outstanding. And it's not the schlock fest that I was expecting. Because uh, <laughs> this was my first time watching this movie. Oh, I was just going to ask that. Wow. All the way through. All the way okay. through. I've seen, I've seen clips of it because obviously, I, I said this pre-show, like if, if you've lived in society, you've seen at least <laughs> a few clips of yeah. this movie. Um, whether it be the ending, you know, whether it be a madhouse uh, or, or anything along those lines. You've whether heard, it be space balls. Yep. Ex something. Exactly. Exactly. You, you've, you've, you've experienced it one way or the other, but this was all, all the way through. And I was fully expecting it to be over the top acting and, uh, you know, men in rubber masks, women in rubber masks, just running around, uh, you know, being silly. <laughs> And it's actually a surprisingly deep movie yeah. with with a with a with a plot that uh, leaves you understanding the loneliness um, that uh, that that is taking place here. You know, a world that has long uh, removed itself from George, from the character of George Taylor's time um, and and existence. You know, the fact that he got that far ahead in uh, in in time just by going out in space you know the excellent plot point of you know the the drive of their own spaceship being the one that propels them so far into this future and you know them being surprised that uh that the world has very much changed to say the least um and then finding out that it is indeed their world at the end was is the capper of it all it's a great story great plot great experience and i'm thrilled to have been able to experience it finally and chris i thank you for that Oh, let me put him thrilled that I, I literally didn't seen it before. Wonderful. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And for the man who's probably seen it the most out of all of us, Mr. Edward. I, I have seen it hundreds of times. Yes. I think it's safe to say. Um, so there are certain movies in my life that have had just an indelible impact on just me as a person. This is one of those films. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I first saw the movie, ah, probably late 70s, early 80s, it was on TV. I'm sure Shane remembers this all the time. Oh, yeah. Like, it's always yeah. being played on, like, local stations. And marathons of and they all play the all movies. Yeah, so, yep. so it was probably the early 80s when I – because by that point, all the movies were done. That I first saw it. And as a kid – so I'm, I'm very young. So, But as a kid, I'm just in awe of, like Ian said, the world that's being presented to me. And a couple things that I just want to touch upon right, right off the bat. First of all, I, I, I vividly remember the moment this movie really captured me. Mm -hmm. When those guerrilla soldiers appear for the first time on screen. Mm. And at, at first, they just you just hear the hunting horn. Yeah. And then you don't see them. You, just see, them, you see them with like the rakes, like moving the corn back and forth. Yeah. Then the muzzles bush. of the guns firing. Then the horses. And then finally, as Heston's running towards the camera... The gorillas appear, and I was like, <laughs> was blown off. the top of my head was blown off. I was like, wow, okay. I was a little kid. I was amazed, all right? And I remember one time, because I watched the movie. It was on TV a lot, we often on weekends. Yeah. I was watching it with my grandfather. who He and I watched a lot of movies together. And my grandfather was a combat veteran of World War II, and he saw the absolute worst of humanity. He saw people killed. He killed people. I mean, obviously, it stayed with him his entire life because he told me all of his stories. And I remember watching this movie with him. Mm -hmm. vividly and every time dr zayas who i think is the most compelling character in the movie um is speaking about man and the human race my grandfather would always say things like yep that's true we're killers yeah. mm -hmm. and as i've gotten older and you know you get more sophisticated more intellectual however you want to put it and you start to appreciate everything that's going on in this film like ian said this is not just some schlocky, you know, disposable sci-fi film. Yeah. Frankly, I think this is a terrifying movie. Mm -hmm. And it is a movie that if you're a Pollyanna type person, 
this is not the movie for you. As far as I'm concerned, and, and I, I, especially as a student of history, I, I believe this wholeheartedly, the human race is a terrible thing in many ways. And this movie pulls no punches in, it leaves you with no hope at all. Yeah. And it, it really goes right to the heart of what man is, yeah. especially as a collective and what man is capable of. As Isaiah said, you know, his his genius walks hand in hand with his idiocy. Mm. And I think the movie really, really, I mean, you have to remember this movie was made six years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, which nearly wiped out, you know, most of human civilization. So and that's something that's on people's mind when this movie came out, the Cold War, all that was going on. And I, I think the film really does a service in really going to the heart of what great science fiction is, and that it, 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 you know, it takes, to use one of Shane's favorite words, these fantastical environments and worlds, but it does it in such a way that it makes you very uncomfortable, but also it makes you reflect on what is this movie really saying about us? Mm -hmm. What it's saying is not good. Yeah. And, and I, I'm not saying that to be you know, uh, negative. I just think it's true. <laughs> and, and what I love it, last thing I'll say in this initial thoughts is I've really come to appreciate as I've gotten older, Heston's character. I mean, he's a majestic over actor, which I've always loved about him, but what they have his character saying throughout the film, just how cynical he is. Yeah. Um, and the fact that at the end, he's the only like intelligent human left and he's a man who has, has no hope he left earth because he'd lost all faith in humanity and now basically it's up to him to try to salvage and restore the human race which is a great mm -hmm. a great twist uh this is like one of my top 10 films I, I think i know some people i won't name names but one of our dearest uh friends on the show will will attack this film for the costumes and the makeup <laughs> come on I think I know of whom. Yes. Yeah. First of all, go, look at the story. And number two, when you think about when the movie was made, the makeup effects are amazing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now, if if the ape the apes are in the background, they're clearly wearing masks because they're they're in the background. Mm -hmm. But if anybody's in the foreground, that is, that is John Chambers' brilliant makeup work, and there's a yeah. reason why he won an Oscar, because the way he, the expressiveness of the eyes of the actors, mm -hmm. the way that their features move, it's, it's an incredible work for when that movie was done. Last thing I'll say, and I'll bring this up more later, I, I made a point just last week, because it came out in the same year, I watched 2001 A Space Odyssey again, Good. which I haven't seen in years. Another, another titanically important science fiction that came out in the same year. So as we move along, I'm going to make a couple comments about my reaction to that film now versus Planet of the Apes. Those are my initial thoughts, gentlemen. Yep, they do both have ape-like creatures in them. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I immediately my brain goes to as you were talking about the uh, the, the cynicism and all that. Never trust a man over thirty. <laughs> <laughs> well, just in like a lot of people, I think find the opening of the film slow, mm -hmm. especially a twenty-first century mentality. But, it, but find... it, adds, it adds to the twilight zoneness of it all, though. Exactly, and yeah. I find it riveting because especially the first few times, or if you don't know the story that well, you're like, where the hell are they? Like, where are they going? Are they, like, why is there like lightning? Like what's going on here? I mean, the way, now the director, Franklin J. Schaffer, one of the great, he directed Patton among many other films, tremendous filmmaker. The way he captures the, the forbidding world that they're in, it's really chilling. And when, when Heston's character, George Taylor, is really ripping on Landon, mm -hmm. it was like the more ide idealistic like he puts the little flag down, which is absurd, of course. But <laughs> um, but I love that dynamic because Lannon's like the hopeful character and Heston's like, look, you might as well have fallen out of a tree here. Um, so I'll stop there. But there's there's so much to talk about. <laughs> well, and, and, and even just with, with a twist of direction, where could they have ended up? Mm -hmm. Because they could have gone the like kind of the opposite direction from what they did. Oh, yeah. And ended up finding everything that the end of the movie shows you mm, right good away. Point. Good mm -hmm. point, Shane. It's a so good point. with just a little twist of fate and, and dumb luck, they end up really thinking they're in another place because nothing's familiar. There's not a clue yeah. as to where they are. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's a good point because remember when uh, they decide which way they're going to go and, and Taylor says that way and, and Dodge says any particular reason you just said none at all. Yeah. And that's no, the way they just, move. That's yep. the way they go. Really, really this, this movie uh, – 
it would have been a detriment to the movie had they known early you know at like oh, oh yeah yeah, yeah. The, the the reveal at the end with the with the statue of liberty whether you've seen it or not the the way they set it up and i mean i know we're jumping to the end here but like the way they set it up with the uh, with the booming shot that we first initially yep. get first of heston's reaction and then you actually see what he's reacting to that's masterful storytelling yep. in movies right there um and yeah. And it just would have it, the entire thing would have been taken away had we landed in like seen the tatters of an American flag or something like that. You know, right. it, would, it would have been yeah. it would have been like way, completely ruined in that way. Or, or think about. I'm sorry, Shane. Go ahead. Well, and to a certain extent, the only other person that possibly would have even understood that mm -hmm. was Doctor Zayas. Right. Maybe some of the other people at his level, but we didn't we didn't get to meet or really learn about them. But Nova doesn't know what it is. Nobody else is around that would even understand what he's seeing. Well, the great thing, this is why I think Dr. Zayas is the most interesting character in the film. As Taylor says, the keeper of the terrible secret. Yeah. He always knew. Oh, yeah. And you'll notice when, it, it's, it's subtle, but it's great, when, when he first walks into the, to the, the, the uh, laboratory uh, cages mm -hmm. to see Taylor for the first time, watch his expression when he sees him. He knows right away, this is what I've always dreaded. This is yeah. what I, I've, I've worried about, and now he's here. This yep. is not the normal man that I'm yeah. used to. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the the fact that this movie came out in 1968, and uh, sure, at that point, you know, we, un, unmanned space travel had you know made it in, made it into space. We you know we we landed on the moon, uh, land, landed on the moon the next year, yep. and, and whatnot. Um, it, it still kind of felt weirdly right uh, with with the with at least them in the spacecraft and what have you obviously you know we don't know what year they theoretically were in initially until their well, their space so travel in the yeah in the beginning i think it's the early the, supposed to be the early 70s yeah correctly. 72 or something like that yeah. in the mm -hmm. in the beginning it, there's chronometers for where pretty sure it's early 70s where it was where okay. they are and i'm pretty sure it's at 72 on it okay cool um but but either but either way uh like you know the f the fact that they themselves thought that they that they were well one of two things either they were heading home and they were expecting you know some sort of welcome from whatever society would have been in their many many years not in society because of the space travel that they were in or something had gone horribly awry and they crash landed on you know this this other planet i find that interesting that like because of how desolate it is when they land they initially assume that this is not their world sure. right yep. um, that makes perfect sense. specifically think they're on an earth on a planet orbiting one of the stars in the constellation orion yeah. yes yeah yeah that, that that's that, that to me sets the stage beautifully for this entire movie and i also didn't know just how long heston's character goes without speaking oh yeah yeah that i didn't remember bright eyes yep. right so well yeah um which just brings home the whole uh the whole aspect of what human humanity has become um that that even later on uh you know the the apes are discussing how you know they, they've done they've done research and they don't they don't understand why uh why humans don't speak because they have all of the proper right. you know uh vessels to speak within their bodies but they're just the mind isn't there and here is heston's character of george taylor being unable to speak and then finally when he makes his first words like the reaction of the apes and just the the the, the magnitude of it all really sinks in and that's what also makes the at the end of the hunt when the guerrilla soldiers speak for the first time, smile, yeah, and they're posing with their with their trophies. It's so shocking because, like you said, the humans aren't talking, yeah, and Heston's been shot in the throat, so he can't talk. And then you have these guerrilla soldiers speaking as as humans would who are just enjoying themselves. Mm -hmm. It's a I, I I try to think about people who saw this movie in 1968. Like I've mentioned, it, I asked my parents about it because they saw it. And just how it must have blown people away because, yeah. I mean, there's been tons of science fiction up to that point. Obviously, you know, and it's a lot of great stuff. But this was, I think, this was on a whole nother level. In part because, and you had you had a a a plus level director 
helming the film. Mm -hmm. And you had great screenwriters. Yeah. Because the book by Pierre Boulet, which came out in the early 60s, which I read in high school, bears very little resemblance to this movie um, <laughs> or what comes afterward. Do you guys know how, how – do you guys know the basic thrust of the book? I mean, I, I, I'm 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 literally looking at spoilers for it right here yeah. on, on IMDb, and funny enough, the twist ending at the end of that novel is the twist ending that Tim Burton went with oh, for boy. his version yeah, of Planet of the Apes. Yep, I'm so glad they changed it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and the key thing about the book, I mean, I read it in high school, so I, I remember it roughly. But you know, the apes had automobiles they mm -hmm. had aircraft they wore you know human style mm -hmm. suits yeah um they Except had to use cities. gloves instead of boots that's right yeah. they, they, hand like feet well put well done and they had you know big buildings and i mean as you i did a lot of behind the scenes reading for this movie a part was like we can't afford to do all that <laughs> so <laughs> we're just gonna you know make this village basically mm -hmm. but i think in a way it, it's it's even more effective because it's this other worldly element so which yes. makes the astros think okay we're not on earth yeah mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And that's what really makes the the ending just all that much more powerful. And apparently, in the original book, they were not on Earth, but then made their way back to Earth and find out that. And Apes again, of, going yeah. with the with the Burton twist that that Earth itself has taken the same ev evolutionary shift yes. um, as the world that they were on. Which you know, what a twist! But you know, not, <laughs> not, not nearly as effective as as the as the reveal I think in the movie really. Mm -hmm. Yep. So something I was thinking about watching this movie this time, and I and I kind of forgot who or if the other humans on in, around spoke, because in the be in the beginning when they were in the cages together, and Nova's there, yeah. and Taylor would speak, she would put her her hands up to his mouth to stop. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought, well, because I didn't remember everything, I thought, well, mm. maybe she's doing that because. They don't speak in front of the gorillas. Yeah, me, the Tarzan, Eugene, yeah, and and just kind of keep it hidden that they can speak. And she's trying to tell Taylor, "Hey, no, 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 don't do that here. Just hold on." Mm -hmm. And then I thought I kept waiting for her to say something, and that never happened. And then you yeah. know, get to the end, I'm like, "Oh, okay, they don't speak." Yeah, um, but which, just, which 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 oh, to me enough. says which to me says you know you're doing something weird. Stop. Yeah. More than anything yeah. else. Yeah. 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 Yep. Or it could have meant that she recognized because it. it because she had a mind. Oh yeah. She re yeah. She re it's almost like she was like a child in some ways, but mm -hmm. she she recognized that what he was doing was putting them in danger. Mm -hmm. Basically. Yeah. Also, just because you mentioned child, I will mention the old Hollywoodness of this all, that there was a 22-year age difference between Charlton Heston and Linda and Harrison when, <laughs> when, this, uh, when this movie was filmed. So you could have literally had another adult in the, in the age difference between the two of them. Um, but that's, well, that's, I, that's Hollywood. <laughs> I, think I, looked, I think I looked her up, and didn't she play – in Cocoon as Steve Gutenberg's love interest eventually in that movie? Uh, let me take she a look. was in Cocoon, but I don't think she was his love interest. She played she played Susan in Cocoon. So and I can't I, I haven't seen Cocoon in years. She was she, she was, was the girlfriend of Zanuck, one the head of 20th Century Fox. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she had like in those days, like they would give young actors like contracts, they put it to put her into like an acting school. So she had you know, she had a variety of experiences as an actress before, during, and after this film. I yeah. mean, this is what she's most – she's still alive, actually. She's in her, I think mm -hmm. she's in her yeah. 70s. Yeah. I think she, she might have the only cast member still alive. Um, but, um, you know, this obviously this this was like the high point of her – because she was in the sequel as well, of yeah. her acting career. So – yeah, and and she she's still acting actually. Uh, she uh, she was in something called Midnight Massacre in 2023. Oh, terrific! And she was in both cocoons, both Cocoon and Cocoon: The Return. <laughs> I, they're great movies. I, I I enjoy the first Cocoon. I, mean, I don't think I've even seen the second one. Now that I think, it's about not it. as good as the first one, but the first one's really good. Yeah, it's yeah. A Ron Howard film. Yep. Let's let's talk about the fact that there were five movies in this franchise of of Planet of the Apes. I can safely <laughs> say I have seen them all. I know I like like Chris and I talked. There are they were there were marathons oh, on yeah. you know UHF channels all weekend, and I know <laughs> I have seen every single movie multiple times. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't remember any of them. So now part of me wants to go back and revisit and watch them because I know Roddy McDowell 
He's in appears in a lot of them or all of them. He, he's not. He's not in the second one. They had another right. actor. He wasn't available. Got it. But he's in the rest of them. Um, um, I, I love him as an actor. So wonderful to actor. Follow him through these sequels was, was well, a lot of fun. Well, what I would say, um, I would recommend watching all of them. Okay. Now you you watch the budgets shrink from movie to movie basically. Um, yes, as the makeup gets more that. and more like yeah. plastic masks. Yeah. As we um, but they're all worth seeing. Uh, the second film is like a direct sequel to the first one. Unfortunately, it's yeah. it's not the same caliber of director. Yeah. Um, so it's not it's not I I, I, I enjoy the second one. I, it's no not, none none of them touch the original. They just don't. The second one's um, the last one with Charlton Heston in it as well. Correct. Yeah, he, he dies within like the first fifteen minutes. That's, of yeah. course. Yeah. Um, but um, they're they're all because they're they're all they're all telling this larger story, and, and you know it's it's really I mean Ricardo Montalban's in one of them. Like, oh, that's, <laughs> right. that's right. <laughs> but um, you know, without spoiling too much, people haven't seen the sequels. Like basically, after after the second one, you end up back in the in the nineteen seventies. And then, and then they kind of show you. It's almost like time is doing a loop, and then they're going to show you how the apes are eventually going to become what they become. But they're 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 worth watching. Um, but but the original for me, you know, stands on by its by itself. Yeah, and and eventually, I mean, I I know that uh, a few of them essentially went straight to video, um, or at least one or two of them did. But e either either way, I, I think it was looking at the reviews. Three and I think three and five had the strongest reviews out of out of the the sequels. I mean, uh, Escape from the Planet of the Apes and then uh, Battle for the Planet of the Apes. I believe right? so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that four is more of a standalone story from That's what Conquest I'm of the Planet of the Apes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is also enjoyable. That yeah, I, I may sit. I may sit down and watch them all. To be honest with you, just to just to experience them and knowing that I'm not really getting like a a consistency but at the same time i'm getting apes and maybe yes. that's <laughs> and the second film what's interesting about the second film without going into too much detail is that it further explores the ape society mm -hmm. especially the tension between and they, they touch upon this in the first movie too the tension between let's call it the three casts so the the gorillas the orangutans and the chimpanzees yeah which mm -hmm. is barely the surface of that was barely scratched in the first yeah. movie. Yeah. we get one and little remark amongst between zira and that other the quota system was abolished <laughs> yeah. The idea that the, the the chimps are kind of a, a lower class. Yes. Mm. So the second film, they go into that in some more detail. Um, they introduce the, the the character of General Ursus, who was like the warlord of the the gorilla army, mm -hmm. um, and he's they've used tons of stuff with him in other books and comics and everything else. But um, in the third film, I'll, I'll say in is that it's about Zira and Cornelius mm -hmm. using Taylor's ship. Mm -hmm. yeah to get to the past. Interesting. Okay. That, 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 that third one is actually pretty damn good, actually. Yeah. It's, the, it's those two actors, mm -hmm. Tim Hunter or Roddy McDowell had wonderful chemistry. Yeah. yeah. Now trying to navigate. And that, that movie tells a very interesting story till you get to the very end scene and you see. That's, yeah. Let's not spoil it for yeah. you. But, yeah. Um, yeah. It's really what good. Did, what did you guys okay. think of, of Zir and Cornelius? I think just think they're fascinating characters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in in general, I think that uh, that they're executed really well. Um, that they are scientists. That they are that they're learning along with 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 Heston essentially. That they're 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 being challenged with their uh, beliefs and ideas of what the human race are, similar to the way that us as humans, when we first started investigating apes, you know, and learning and learning about how human they very well are in comparison to us um it, it's it, it, it you kind of see that happening there and then you know eventually you know once what once once they find out taylor can talk that's you know mind blown but also yep. at the same time you know zira's theories are now proven correct and what have you and it really broadens it and allows them to understand that you know scientifically it's okay to be wrong every now and then um, as long as you learn from the mistake in the end. And not only that, uh, I think the movie does this magnificent job of really addressing something that all societies deal with, which is, which is, you know, hidden ugly truths that let's say the establishment wants to maintain or mm -hmm. conceal in this case, because they feel it'll upend their, their, their control. 
yeah. their, their power dynamic over that yeah. society. We see that in all societies throughout history. And the, just the idea that, like, the hearing scene, mm -hmm. I think is one of the most compelling scenes in the whole film. Yeah. Because, you know, they're asking some really, you know, let's use Ian's word, some very deep questions about just the nature of their very civilization and what does it actually mean? And, and is it even true? Mm. Like what they've based all of their belief system on. And yeah. obviously anytime you, you like when Zira, Zira says about the sacred scrolls, well, maybe they're not. And, and, he's, and Krenna's is like, oh, I'm not going to fight that battle with you. But, you know, <laughs> the idea that they're, they're challenging, you know, the, these, these foundational, you know, Truth. myths and stories yeah. about their society. Which, yeah. you know, in every society, you have people, for better or for worse, who do that. And and oftentimes, in the end, it, sometimes it can lead to great violence and destruction, but it also may lead to, you know, unvarnished truths that ultimately people need to know. Mm -hmm. But, of course, you always have the power brokers like, wait a minute, this is what Zaius is. If we reveal all this, because Zaius always knew, if we right. reveal all this, it'll upend our entire civilization. Yeah. So, again, the the... the this is a dark film. <laughs> and when, when they, like, when when they're when they're trying when they're challenging, and you and you know, Cornelius and Zero are going to go to prison. Like they're, and even though you can tell Zayas kind of has like an affection for them, especially for her. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that doesn't matter. You're keeping your mouth shut because if yeah. this gets out, everything yeah. we know to be true is not true. And like, like the whole what? concept of the forbidden zone is all is all that's all that is. It, it, so, it, talking about keeping your mouth shut. It quite literally happens when Taylor tries to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll represent myself. And yep. their response is to literally try to gag him yep. uh, because because the idea of a human speaking is such a uh, a no, no um, that, you know, God forbid he try to actually intellectually represent himself in court that yep. that that will blow society apart. Like the prosecutor says, these remarks are profane and irrelevant. <laughs> and yet, and yet, Dr. Zaya still had him tailor into his private chamber. Oh, that's a great scene. To mm -hmm. discuss my what favorite was going scene in the on. Film. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It was really good. And, and, actually, and actually calling him Taylor uh, yes. with, yeah. was the humanizing part of it all. Yeah. Well, that scene, which, which is my favorite scene in the film, because you see how a complex character Zayas is. But also that he, 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 you know, he's accepting this burden of, of silencing, you know, what's really true for the sake of the civilization as they know it. And, you know, when he, when he basically, when, there's a great moment where he brings up the fact that Taylor said he was born in um, the town of Fort, Fort Jefferson. Fort, Fort, yeah, Fort. And, and Wayne, Zayas goes, Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne, I'm in sorry, Indiana. in Indiana, I think it was. Right. And Zayas then goes, a fort unconsciously you chose a name that is belligerent so he's so focused on the fact that human beings are monsters of destruction and we cannot allow them to breed remember he tells to, 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 to sister taylor where is your tribe where are your women hmm. um, because he wants to eradicate it yeah and he says you know we're going to emasculate you <laughs> and, yeah. and, and and experiment on your brain it's it's a it's a tremendous scene really and, well done and that they did experiment on the brain of you know yeah. landon well, Landon, yeah. yeah, that was that was heartbreaking uh, when when you see that reveal of essentially the lobotomy scar on oh, yeah. on, on Landon's head, um, and, and just uh, the experience of that. Uh, ooh, that was that you was... bloody baboon! Yep, you cut out his brain. <laughs> you took away his memory. That's what you want to do to me. There's so many great Heston moments in this oh, film. Oh my god, <laughs> yep. Ian, use your use your term, please. It's a madhouse. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably actually Heston. I read an interview. He said this probably one of the toughest shoots of his acting career because he was getting hosed down, beaten mm. up, yes. dragged around. Oh my yeah. god, the hosing, the hosing. Yeah. Thank you for bringing up the hosing. Yeah. I, I, like I'm thinking to myself, how many takes did that take? And and if if they weren't a fan of Heston, maybe they put through in a couple of extra takes just to just to experience a little bit more yeah. uh, vibe. I remember I remember reading that he said that the hosing down was awful. <laughs> um, oh, I believe it because uh, he's he's basically semi naked through the entire yeah. film. Yeah, I, I don't even know if he had like pads on his feet or, or I couldn't tell her. I didn't know when yeah. when you saw him draw uh, dragged across his feet were dirty and bare. It did not look like he really wore anything. 
it, unless unless they gave him false feet, which sometimes I know that, that they do that in today's filming, but I don't know if yeah. they were smart enough to do that back then. Because yeah, I mean the picture that I have in here near the end of the movie, he is he is quite literally wearing just the Tarzan loincloth yeah. because that's. <laughs> That's yeah. that's all that's left of of it. And I remember earlier on in the uh, in the movie where you know they're they're th when they're first trying to figure out what he is when he still can't talk and like like oh oh look at the human trying to put on clothes like a yes. civilized person. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the great aspects of the film that I'm sure the audience appreciated right away is that you know you're seeing human behavior as we would as we would treat pets. Mm -hmm. and animals but now it's we're the ones who are the zoo animals essentially yeah. um and it, you know obviously there's so many great moments where, where they really milk that um in the film like when, get when he's the veterinarian running... get the veterinarian yes <laughs> i'm nothing but a vet this laboratory like when he's running through when the, when the gorilla police are chasing he's running through that museum mm -hmm. and he comes upon dodge stuffed yeah <laughs> as one of the, one of the exhibits uh oh, man. It, it's really chilling like it, it's and yep. you, you you feel i don't know have you guys had this experience as i watch the movie as an older man you just feel utterly hopeless like there's no way he's really going to get out of this because mm -hmm. it, it's like he's just been dropped on you know on the moon essentially and and nothing there's everything around him is kind of familiar but at the same time it's not yeah a and yeah. and there's nothing he can do about it no <laughs> <laughs> but that's and even that's even what when that's he makes the movie honestly yeah yeah even, every turn he tries he is mm. beaten backwards yeah you know i think this viewing might be the first time i realized that that uh i assume it was like a wax figure in the museum but no oh. it's, it's the taxidermized yep. corpse yeah. of his yep. erstwhile crewmate i had never realized that i don't oh, think i so much at this time yeah. let's yeah. point out by the way that um and this again great science fiction you have a black astronaut. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. Which, mm -hmm. again, it's great when you saw movies, you know, to try to push things forward like that with that kind of representation. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, there were no African-American astronauts in 1968, certainly. Right. So yeah. it was just great that, you know, that, again, that they're just, they're, their ship took off as, as, as Merge, uh, I'm sorry, as Shane's just a few years into the future from when the movie is made. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, that, was, that was a nice touch as well. What do we think, by the way, of how they use the character of Stuart in the beginning of the film? <laughs> now, in, when I mentioned in my initial thoughts about how this uh, uh, it took some strides to breaking the mold of uh, yeah. what uh, sci-fi adventure films of the 50s and 60s had been. See, I, I watched several of them as a kid. They'd, they'd be on the various Turner networks, which mm -hmm. I would see at, in Stone Harbor in the summers where we had cable. And uh, I was always annoyed when uh, the filmmakers would see foot to it insert female characters as love interests mm. where none had been in the books on which a lot of these stories were you know like the, the jules <clears throat> Verne stories and uh, uh journey to the center of the earth and whatnot they they had to insert this you know, usually pretty blonde female character to make kissy kissy with one of the main male heroes and they were kind of faked out in the opening of this movie because there's exactly that kind of character in her little hypersleep chamber aboard the spaceship but after they crash land down Everybody looks into her little hyperbaric chamber, and there's her desiccated corpse, yep. which has been dead for years, apparently. And just at that moment, this is genius timing, we hear the, the shrieking of the metal hull of the spaceship as the yep. water pressure builds in, and it, it, it gives way, and the water comes gushing in. It sounds exactly, for a second there, like a human scream. The very one that's well bottled in all of us as we look yeah. on this scene of horror. And, and just, I, I love this. It secured my loyalty immediately when I saw that it was <laughs> there's not going to be any little frou frou love interest hanging around with the astronauts on the planet of the apes. And in <laughs> fact, was a, a great point is that when when um, Heston is having soliloquy in the presence of Nova, he basically admits she was on this trip so we could breed. Yeah, like that. That was her. <laughs> I was surprised by that. He's the new Eve, that. as he put it. Yep. Yeah. Um, I want to mention, by the way, um, at some of our super shows, one of our guests, a writer by the name of Drew Gaska, yep. mm -hmm. wrote a wonderful book, a, a Conspiracy of the Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. And in yep. that book, which I highly recommend to anybody who's fans of the original movie, it's what happens to Landon after he's captured. So it's the whole story from Landon's perspective up to his lobotomy. Mm -hmm. Really well done. There's great... Uh, painted pages and it. it's an it's it's a prose book but there's painted art in it i forgot the publisher of it um boom, and uh, i think is a boom it, it also goes into stewart's backstory as well 
So anybody who really loved this movie and want to learn, get more of a, like a backstory feel, get yeah. that book. It's really well done. Yeah, and, and it does look like it's still available on Amazon even as you know the Planet of the Apes uh, is, there it is, is, yep. is now with Marvel. Um, That's a you, Starenko cover, you, by the way. Yep, you can still find yep. copies of it uh, around. So uh, do, do, do give that a shot if you can. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I highly recommend it. I, I think, too, that initial death at the beginning also drove home what type of character we were going to be getting out of George Taylor, that he himself is a little bit disconnected. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. that, that, oh, that, that, love that, making, but no love. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, even in his in his opening monologue, uh, you know, talking about how, you know, that there have been. Oh, I'm sorry. There wasn't the opening model. It was later. Well, I think it was a little bit later on, where he was like, you know, there's, there's been, there's been, you know, plenty of women, but uh, you know, I've, I've never really found love or what have you. And it, it, it just says to me that this is a disconnected character who probably became an astronaut because he didn't have any connections. To be honest with you. Oh yeah, I think you're absolutely on the money there, Ian. But now, yeah, I mean, here's the, here's yeah, the only ahead, thing I question about that part in in relation to just being an astronaut, which I've never been, but <laughs> would they have sent someone like that in space to I, I, head I think, this mission? Well, I think specifically this mission where they, he, they knew that they were coming back to a world where all of their loved ones were dead, mm -hmm. because I, I think this may actually be a benefit rather mm -hmm. than a, a deterrent. Well, uh, maybe, maybe for him, but the other guys on it sure didn't. Seem well, Dodge they established was a scientist, so for him, this is all about exploration and discovery. Right. And you know, yes. there's the great interaction between Landon and, and Taylor, where mm -hmm. Landon basically admits that you know he felt he had to to uphold his reputation. You know, the Golden Boy of '72, like he had to participate in this mission, and clearly, of the three, he had the hardest time accepting, yeah. you know, this new reality. And if you go back to the opening scene where Heston is. Again, a majestic soliloquy in, into the microphone. And he's just talking about there's got to be something better than man, right? Yeah. So, and that's what makes the ending of the film so deeply disturbing is that, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, there's, there's he, not... he realizes, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I'm glad Murd mentioned the wonderful sound effect when, when the, the ship hull starts to cave in. How good is the music in this film? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Jerry Gold's oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like an atonal. Like it's a, when you think about when this was like, this is a really interesting score. It's mm -hmm. it would be atonal, wouldn't it be, Murd, in many ways? Uh, you, you could call it that. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of un unusual rhythms being used. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, parts of it are certainly atonal. But, but it also certainly. Uh, goes with the the twilight zone niche of it yep. all because it, yeah. you, could, you could easily insert um bits of this into a twilight zone episode and it would work mm -hmm. um uh, so absolutely you know goldsmith has that feel and personality to it along those lines there is actually a cut you can find online that cuts the movie down to twilight zone episode length and even huh. Huh. Even uses a Serling uh, narration at the beginning and end that match up with the, <laughs> the tone of the movie itself um, to make it into a Twilight Zone episode. So uh -huh. uh, something that might be worth uh, uh, see seeking out there one way or the other. And Serling wrote, I did again some background. Reading. This, this this movie took a long time to make. It took yes. a while to get the funding for it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the producer Arthur P. Jacobs was like a, just like a a real like he just persevered to get this movie made. But Heston, when Heston came on board, because he he believed in it too, that also helped. And they did a very famous makeup test, which I think you can see online. Yes, and, and, and it, that was 1966, the Planet of the Apes test reel specifically, yes. because it's on it's on the director's IMDb as well. Uh, so two years before the movie came out. Yeah, that's, so Heston did it, and Edward G. Robinson. Was originally supposed to be Zayas. Oh wow! Um, and they have uh, and Linda Harrison is in it, and also Josh. I think Josh, not Josh, James Brolin, mm -hmm. is in the okay. test footage. Interesting. Uh, and uh, you know they're, they're they wanted to see if the makeup would actually work mm -hmm. on screen, and and the test footage was successful. Again, like Ian said, you could you could see it. It's fascinating. Um, but the movie was this was a it was this was a challenge to make this film, like just to get it funded. 
a lot of studios felt that that this talking monkeys this is not going to work um but again you have the right director you have a big a, a huge actor supporting it and you have serling who wrote many drafts now that the screenplay is like a combination of things he wrote and the right the screenwriter michael Wil wilson contributed yes but, um i think i want to say it was boom released a book a couple of years ago of serling's script they did as a graphic novel interesting which is very I think, interesting i do I, I think read, i have that I, I read it as well um if, if you're really into the planet of the apes i recommend that also because it, it just gives you like if serling had just written like the movie like an earlier draft of it this is what it would have been mm -hmm. basically so it's very different from what you see on mm. the finished film i can see Ian's ah. looking for that right now as we speak yes definitely uh the let's see it was that the plan the, not the planet of the apes visionaries was it I think it might, might be that. Mm, show, me yeah, the, yeah. show me the cover. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, that's, the that's, cover exa that's exactly what it is. Yep, and I, I even remember this cover, to be honest with you, because this, this came out in uh, 2018. God, that and, long ago already. Holy Yeah, God. and I, I <laughs> definitely remember this cover. Uh, the, the Planet that's of it. the Apes. That's universe. it, yep. Yep. You'll notice that they stick to the book and that the apes have, you know, all the trappings of modern humanity. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Essentially. So. Uh, something something that i found out uh in the trivia for this movie apparently charlton heston had the flu yes th through most of the filming and they decided to roll with it because it would mm. it would it would it would make the the character seem that much more sickly mm -hmm. and uh and overwhelmed if the actor himself was overwhelmed this whole experience is supposed to seem register as a fever dream anyway so why not film it while the lead actor actually has a fever <laughs> exactly exactly so ian I, since you're the, this is your first time mm -hmm. the classic scene where heston speaks for the first time yeah how did you react to that first off it's an excellent use of 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 sound mm -hmm. um because the the way that there's there's sound around him sound around him and then you know get your paws off me you damn dirty ape and then complete silence after, after yeah. that yeah is just a wonderful touch um and and gets the point across beautifully that they were that they were trying to trying to uphold that yes you know this is a man that uh, that can indeed talk and he is going to shock the world around him in doing so i i think i think they executed that beautifully and in the lead up to that uh, when he's being pursued by the guerrilla soldiers notice how shafter like he flips the camera like over, like everything's disorienting. Like you're like yeah. seeing things from his perspective, like how he's trying to get out and he doesn't know where to go. And when you think about it, the set they're on really isn't that big. Like they've made like, like a little village, but the way they shoot it all, you feel like you're in some like larger metropolis in a sense, which is I think really what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, because it, look, there are clearly more apes running around than, than buildings that they could actually be in on the scenes. <laughs> but um but it, it just the again if shafter was a tremendous director but yeah that whole sequence where they're hunting him and he's running through the city um and then i have to because ian set it up very nicely after he's caught when they put him back in the cage and now he's talking and it's full on heston oh yeah <laughs> um you know julius the girl like zookeeper with a cigar and shut up you freak and he's hosing him down it's a mad house yeah i, I get chills every time because okay. it's it's so over the top, but it works. It's oh, like it totally it's like works. it's like yes. Shatner, like at his greatest moments. Like yes. it, just, it just works. Which also <laughs> that brings it back to Serling even further, because you know Serling worked with Shatner on uh, on, uh, yes. on on Twilight Zone, and yeah. you know that 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 bridges that gap very nicely. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um uh also uh you mentioned the uh the casts uh of the yeah. uh, of the different uh you know apes and what have you apparently while they were filming this movie yep. unintentionally the ape actors separated where gorillas would, would sit with gorillas orangutans with orangutans chimps with chimps um it just it just apparently naturally happened on set Jeez. Uh, uh, and that's kind of creepy. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of freaky. <laughs> it's like they were creating the society, whether they yep. knew it or not, on the set itself. <laughs> what? What? I'd love to hear what everybody. How did? Do, how does everybody react to the character of Doctor Zayas? Well, like you say, he's fascinating. Um, yeah. 
he, I, I, again, I could not, I did not remember a lot of this watching it this time. It has probably been 25 years since I've seen it. Yeah. Um, but to watch him at every turn, knowing that he knows exactly what's going on. And he's in, in one way, he's, he's really trying to do what he thinks is the right thing by protecting his society. Right. Mm -hmm. But at all costs. So yeah. like, I start wondering, so when, when Taylor's captured in the, in the town square and speaks that first time and everyone hears it, well, what did Dr. Zayas have to do to all of those people that's so a good that point, they Jane. did not yeah, spread that's a great that point. across society? Did you see this person that this human that talked um, like, yeah, yeah, I saw him and keep going. Like, what did he have to do to contain that? Great point. That's a um, great point. And, and nothing, I don't think anything is beyond his capability to ensure that, that is exactly what happened, that it was contained and nobody would see it past this group of soldiers. Yeah, and like Taylor said, you know, the contradiction of Zayas is he's both a scientist, but he's also the chief defender of the faith. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a politician. Yeah, he's, and so he's a politician. He's also a fanatic. Yes, he is. Um, and that's a very dangerous combination because if if you're both saying you're both a man of science, but you're also a man of, of the faith of the lawgiver in this sense, mm -hmm. there's obviously there's a contradiction at the very heart of that. Absolutely. So what are you going to do? As, and Shane gave a good example to maintain the fiction of that yeah. contradiction you've established. Mm -hmm. I mean, we already saw it right at the end before Taylor and Nova really went off as they were starting to leave. Um, Cornelius and, and, and Zara, was that her name? Zara? Zira. Zira. Yeah. That he had already went back on his word and said, oh, you're oh, yeah. going to jail. Absolutely. That, that's it for <laughs> And you. they blew up the cave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as he said, there will be no doll. I'm sorry. And, and and as is the case with with ever with any man in power, uh, it doesn't matter whether or not it's a uh, a man of the faith, whether it's a you know a politician. He's basically you know he's scientist, politician, man of the faith, all roll up in the one. So there's no separation between church and state. That's number one. Number two, um, when you're in power, the the narrative is the most important thing to keep. And if you lose the narrative, you lose the people. Plain and simple. Yep. So well if, put in. if 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 his narrative is being challenged that the apes are the superior race and that they always have been the superior race, then what are you going to do when yeah. Charlton Heston shows up and, and challenges that the way that 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 he does? Um, you try to suppress it and you try to keep you try to keep your your power in that way. Otherwise, you lose everything. Yeah. So completely understand why he is a multifaceted character in that way and also why he's probably the scariest character oh in he's terrifying movie. yeah he's absolutely terrifying yeah you have I mean, to think it, that yeah, cornelius and zara can't be the only ones that think this they were not the only ones no. cornelius was not the only one on that dig whenever right. he went out there before yeah um so he's really got to keep a tight rein on everything but remember that when there's a great scene where zara and cornelius are having a like a affectionate argument about you know his, his dig and, and she's saying you know you should you should stand up for what you found you know and she says you know kind of naively idealistically you know they'll have to accept it if it's true and he goes oh no they won't yeah and that goes right yeah. back to what ian was saying is that there's a narrative in place yeah and like we've seen in the history of our own country many times we certainly see it right now where certain factions believe certain things mm -hmm. and nothing must ever be allowed to undermine or upend that perception of reality. Because remember, politics often isn't re – often is, is it's not often reality. It's yeah. the perception yes. of reality. Exactly. So in, in those – like Zayas, he's the consummate politician in that sense. And mm -hmm. I mean what – how did you guys like – I think the scene in the cave is just riveting. Like what did you guys – how did you guys react to that? I, I would agree with you as well. I think yeah. I think that uh, um, I mean talking about how scary uh, you know the character is in general, um, it, it got that point across even further there that you know that his 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 beliefs um, have to be protected no matter what, and that that's I, simple. I do think that scene was. Probably the closest we got to Zayas being nervous. Yes. Because oh, there was actual oh. proof and he was grasping at straws to contain it then. 
and finally was able to do that in the end by blowing the cave up. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, and, the, the, go ahead, Dean. I'm sorry. No, and 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 in you know essentially um, keeping the truth out of reach, or at least doing his best to do so. Um, the only way to get rid of the truth is to quite literally get rid of the truth in this. Situation. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You know, and they, the, the the character of Lucius is the wonderful like young like countercultural ape. Um, you know, he's like. Dr. Zayas, why must knowledge stand still? Mm. Right? And Zayas like, well, I may have just saved the future for you, basically. Yeah. And for me, the scene that always stays with me, and, and, and the, that sequence of the movie, when he has Cornelius read one of the, the scrolls. The scroll. The 29th from, scroll. From, yeah, and, and, you know, and it basically says, you know, the idea of man, you know, shun him, drive him out. He is the harbinger of death. Yeah. And he says, you know, the forbidden zone, because the forbidden zone, if you actually look at the map, you can see Long Island. You can, you can kind of see, like, where they are. And he said, you know, this was a paradise once, mm -hmm. and your kind made a desert of it. Yeah. Yeah. So he's not wrong in anything he's saying, but, he, but at the same time, he's so determined to prevent that result from happening to his own civilization. Mm -hmm. that he's willing to go to these extreme lengths um, to, to silence everything. Let's talk and, about the doll uh, on top oh, of yeah. what, what, great. And, and, you know, going once again with, uh, with Zayas, you know, like, oh, uh, you know, my, you know, my family has had plenty of human dolls. My granddaughter <laughs> plays with human dolls. Yes. Yeah, but, but you, don't talk, <laughs> you don't play with human dolls that talk. And yep. the, fa yep. the, fact, the fact that we are lucky enough that after all these years, that doll still had a voice box that worked. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. so that kind of a doll did not have batteries it was just ah, like, true. like a good moo point cow. The, mm -hmm. the the cow thing would that you would turn over and meh, meh. nice that's what that was nice so yeah it, it just made it sound like a crying baby it had no batteries to that doesn't mean it wouldn't have deteriorated my god most yeah. of that oh. stuff was cardboard <laughs> inside but yeah but ne never nevertheless you know enough of a mama yeah. to to get the point across yep. that was that was beautifully executed in the movie and, and and when cornelius is trying to cornelius is a very shrewd character because he realizes what zayas is mm -hmm. a bit more than i think zira does oh i do too and yeah. he's trying to navigate like okay here's what i found at the different levels of the dig and this is what i think it means and zayas mm -hmm. like ah. you know he tries to deny dismiss everything it. he's being yeah, told he dismiss dismiss it. it and you know cornelius is like all right he's trying to like placate him but at the same time tr kind of trying to make his point and Zira's like, talk about the doll, right? You found this doll. Uh, like the the writing in the film is really well done. Like it, yeah. it's this is and not I, like go, go ahead, Shane, please. I got the sense that Cornelius didn't want to bring up the doll; that he wanted to no. keep that hidden for himself. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Cornelius clearly knows, and we see this throughout the movie, that he, he's not as idealistic as his fiance, mm -hmm. and he he completely understands what. Zayas represents like again if you go back to the hearing which is a great scene um and like the, you know Z Cornelius and Zira now risk themselves for Taylor and they, they start to actually challenge you know these 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 foundational you know myths that this whole civilization revolves around yeah. and then of course they do the the see no evil hear no evil yeah. speak no evil which is That's, one of my favorite uh, images of the whole movie it's it's All a right. great image but it's a little corny considering how how specific the rest of the movie is, how thought provoking that that just happens to happen. It's great from our perspective, but right. in the grand scheme of the writing of the movie, it is a little hokey. Well, I read in the, but it works. the scene, Shane, that those the actors did that spontaneously uh -huh. and then they decided to keep it in the film. <laughs> I didn't know that. I mean, that sometimes sometimes uh, it, it's it's things like that, uh, that that really make a movie, whether mm -hmm. intentional or not. And yes, uh, most I, times I, it's better when it's not intentional. Oh, exactly. I, like, for instance, I mean, I talk about movies I just saw for the first time that'll make Chris go, what? I, I, I just I just saw yes. God, Godfather Part One for the first yeah. time. Oh, wow. Um, j we watched all of them uh, it, uh, uh, over the last two weeks. And the, uh, you know, leave the gun, take the cannoli. That, mm -hmm. that is a, a improvised line uh, that 
works beautifully in the scope of the scene. So yeah, sometimes it is those those unplanned moments that make or break a situation in the movie. Absolutely. The um, we go again the cave scene, which again is so thrilling. But when oh there it is, well done, yeah. well done, Ian. Yep. When. And they do it very subtly. It's yes. not all at one time. Yes. It's just as the conversation goes on, they each do their own thing. And yeah. It, and but again, just to go, jump back this image, what like this hearing, I mean, you th again, this wasn't that far away from like the McCarthy era, for example, mm -hmm. when this movie was made. So the idea of, of powerful entities or, or, or groups trying to use their power to, to deny truth, yeah. right? Or, or, or to, to twist their perverted in some way. It's captured so well. Like, like it's obvious this whole trial is rigged. It's a kangaroo court. Yeah. And, and Zayas basically admits that to Taylor when he brings him into his, his, his chambers afterwards. He says, yeah, yeah you're, you're not a mutant. <laughs> or like, no, he says, you know, like I, Taylor says, well, you know I wasn't cooked up in, in a lab. And he says, of course not. Yeah. But that only makes it worse <laughs> because he's determined at all costs, like you guys said, to maintain – that fiction. Uh, but the uh, point, point I was going to make was when you go back to the the cave scene at the end when they have the the, the shootout, and uh, you know then he captures Zayas, and it's a great moment where he ties Zayas up mm -hmm. the way he was bound, and uh, he says to Zira, you know, Quilish, you led me around on a leash. They said, well, we thought you were in fear, and then he says, well, now you know better. Yeah, and it's a very brutal scene because um, you know. He says, "I want this and this, this from the gorillas," and then and then and they, and, and Lucius says, "What if they don't agree to terms?" And he says, "Tell them I'll shoot him." And they're like, "You can't do that." And, and then Zaya says, "Oh yes, he can. He's a born killer." Yeah. Yeah. Remember my grandfather saying, "Yes, we are." Yeah. Um, it's it. There's there's so many moments like that in the film where you're just like, "God, there's no hope." <laughs> <laughs> well, We're let's terrible. Let, let's let's also focus on the fact that. The apes had guns. Um, sure did. That, that, that wasn't, I, I, you know, I'd seen bits and pieces of the movie over the years, but, you know, this being my first way through, I honestly was not expecting them to have guns. I figured that they would have more rudimentary, uh, you know, weapons like slingshots and stuff like that, you know, things that a fall of society and then a new society coming afterwards and also just looking at their at their city and the fact that it's more of a jungle city, yeah. I wasn't expecting weaponry, well, and yet and there it was. So for having the technology for the weaponry to have indoor plumbing for hosing down of things yeah. with mm -hmm. rubber hoses and nozzles and tools to operate on people, apes... I did expect, after seeing it now at this age, I do think the city itself was a little bit too rudimentary for all the stuff that they were that capable was for, That was because of budget, Shane. Oh, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, up until now, tw you know, the previous time seeing it as a, as a kid through, like, young teenage adulthood, I would have never even thought of that. But now, yeah. looking back and going, well... Basically, it's like, of... it's like they're an advancing agricultural society yeah. mm -hmm. that... You know, has developed. You know, they have they have horse drawn wagons. They have, as you said, surgical tools. They have water pressure. Yeah. Um. So, you know, you would imagine in the centuries to come, they're going to have you know sure. automobiles and, yeah. and or you know, combustion engine things like that. Interest, just an interesting little side note, just because I'm a, a, a history freak. The guns they're using mm -hmm. are M1 carbines from World War II, mm. and to make them look otherworldly, they they just pressed these casings around them interesting so like the magazine is that is what's jutting out of the front of that which where you put the new magazine the, these are the those are world war ii era rifles mm -hmm. okay and in the second film they actually have submachine guns mm. which they also encase and those are m3 submachine guns of world war ii uh as well so with the with the indoor plumbing and also even with the weaponry it makes you wonder you know, how much of this was inventions of the apes and how much of them were leftovers from... Uh, oh, yeah. That, that, yeah. You know, That's that a great point, which, which of course, Zayas would never admit. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah, true. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's all it's all the questions that are that are left there for you for you yourself to decide which way it goes. Um, and I appreciate that when a when a sci fi movie doesn't spoon feed you everything, um, that that you're left to decide some things on your own. Sure. I, I really like that. Let's talk about just the shock ending. Mm. Now, obviously, because Ian said, if you're living in, in American popular culture, you probably knew knew about it already. Of course, yeah. yeah. People in 1968 didn't know about it. No. <laughs> and my my parents said they were like, "Whoa!" You know, <laughs> people were really. Well, I would I would imagine that it would feel like the first time I saw The Matrix. That's, ah, that's mm -hmm. really the how how it would feel to me when when you first see where Neo really is. Is like, oh, oh, wow, okay, so he's yep. there. That has to be similar to what was felt when you'd see that for the first time and not know it. I would I would compare it even less so. I, I get the Matrix, the Sixth Sense. I oh, think yeah, I, that's I think, another good I think one. That's that's a good comparison here. And mind you, I feel like M Night Shyamalan wouldn't even have his career without Rod Serling, <laughs> uh, with, with, all, with all the with all the twists that that he would throw into things, whether it be Twilight Zone or otherwise. But um, I, I think that the the execution of this um that you know you could have guessed it you could have guessed it you could have put the clues together but then finally you get that payoff of the statue of liberty itself to drive it all home um and the way that it's played is the same way i felt seeing the sixth sense and and watching that movie to the end and sure. then everything pays off in the end with the with the big reveal of that so yeah the other great thing about the ending is that as taylor is riding away you start to feel hope, like he turns and, you know, he lovingly touches Nova on the cheek. You know, she clearly feels, you know, warmth towards him. And you're like, oh, all right, maybe this is, you know, going to be a happy ending. And then <laughs> you start to see the spokes right from the crown. Yeah. And like Ian said, it's great the way Schaffner shot it because it's above. Yep. And you're like, what is that? Is that what I think it is? And then... It's his reaction to it, and it's it's magnificent Heston Heston acting. You uh, maniacs! <laughs> you blow it! You did it! You finally did it! You blow it all up! <laughs> God damn you all to hell! Oh my Nova's God! Like, What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, she's like, why are you so upset about this lady in the sand? I don't, I don't, I don't get it. That's so weird. Of of course, of course, part of me is like, how the hell did it get there? You know, <laughs> like, I mean, sure, it's been I, I mean, I guess it's been thousands of years since uh, yeah, since the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, would have been there. But like, I'm trying to think of the uh, of I mean, maybe maybe this like and on the image that we're seeing, like maybe this mountain that was here was the base at one point and it fell over as part of some sort of nuclear holocaust. Uh, more like it was blown from its original pedestal and just landed there. OK, yeah, that, that's there was some foreshadowing to this, uh, like when in the opening, when uh, the three astronauts are making their way through the Forbidden Zone and commenting on the terrain and mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, or maybe it was after that. Uh, Taylor remarked on there being some big nasty gouges and you know, mm. craters in the land, and that's I think we were supposed to retroactively conclude that those were blast craters from uh, right nuclear and, bombs. But he said, "Oh, it must have been a storm of meteors." Yeah, yeah. right, right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, sure, man, sure. <laughs> and the scope of of this particular shot, also, like after after we see first, you know, the crown, and and then the the you know the the ah of it all from Preston, yeah. and then just the 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 wide shot on the beach, watching him, you know, losing it. Uh, it it's just beautiful staging, absolutely beautiful. Can't get better than that. No, it's 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 again. It's one of the great endings in the history of film. Um, Absolutely. And and for as much as she could, I I can't imagine Nova just standing there going, "Okay, now what do I do? Look, <laughs> do I do I do I go over to him? Do, what, what? I don't know what this is, a big metal thing. Okay. Yeah, like, I'll just stand here and scratch myself and uh, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> eat some parasites out of my hair until he's finished. <laughs> I I will say I would have liked, and and again I, I don't. I never read the book, which I know is completely different. Mm. And I never read anything surrounding offshoots of this story. 
and I want to again want to watch the second one to see where they really just pick right up from it or not. Mm-hmm. But I wanted like do. An, another two minutes of it to see what happens next after the freak out. Like, does well, he just they, they don't grudgingly. They don't, sh- they don't show you the aftermath of the freak out, but they do show them riding on. Okay. Okay. Um, beneath like the planet, long... the, beneath the planet of the apes is is definitely worth seeing. Um, <laughs> it's just because they 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 give you a little bit more of the ape society. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's 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 not as good as the first one, but it, it's 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 definitely worth seeing. Yeah. I remember liking them all. I just don't yeah. remember them very well now. Yeah. Going back to the to the hunt, mm-hmm. I, I thought the opening hunt was so well choreographed. Oh yeah, and, and terrifying. And it's terrifying because again, it's like you said, like it's from the perspective of the actors. Like they're like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. yeah, and like I said, because they and again, it's great directing by Shafter. They gradually reveal the gorillas, mm-hmm. yeah. and it only makes it that much more chilling um, when you realize that these are human beings being hunted for sport. Um, can I can I roll back yeah, even a little please, bit further please. there? Uh, when when they first uh, you know get their skinny dipping on uh, the, the the astronauts when they leave you know all their stuff on the shore, yeah. and then slowly but surely the tribe of humans steal literally everything that they that they had on them including you know their suits and their and their equipment and anything that they had with them they had a, they had a gun too everything they that might have them. identified them as civilized beings is conveniently yeah. stolen and destroyed yep. exactly exactly and the way that they went about it too kind of reminded me a little bit of like Peter Pan and the Lo- and the Lost Boys, like uh, that. That's the feel I get at least a, a, from the tribe itself in those first couple of seconds until we get the apes. That you know that this is just like a feral society, yep. um, and and you know they don't even necessarily know what they're doing. All they know is this is stuff. It was sitting here. Now it's ours, and we're going to do what we want. That's a great it. point, Ian. And also remember how Zayas talks about. You know, they go into our green belts and ravage our crops. That's what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so the yeah. apes, this is like this is like a pestilence they have to take care of. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Taylor says, well, in six months, we'll be running this planet. And then it's great directing. There's complete silence. Yeah. Because all the humans turn because they they realize, and the astronauts are like, what's going on here? Yeah. And it, it's, it's, it's such great filmmaking because think about how he's – the director is doing – uh, so much but with so little like he's just using atmosphere and the lack of sound mm-hmm. to create a really terrifying um yeah. introduction to, to the to the gorillas oh absolutely yeah, yeah. Which, which just proves time and time again sound is as important as oh pain. yeah like when mm-hmm. it comes to uh talkies you know that like wh- however however you use your soundscape that can be really 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 beneficial well, to you make your movie and even when they're standing there watching the the humans turn their heads and mm-hmm. start to run, like they wait a pretty good long yeah. while before they join them. And I'm like, me, I would knowing that they're indigenous. As soon as they ran, I'd have ran because yeah. you have to think they're running away from something for a reason. So mm-hmm. let's go there quickly. There's nothing yeah. that they have to defend themselves really. I mean, yeah, yeah. they have a gun, but they're it's not they don't have it now. Like, no. And imagine it. Imagine if they had the pistol and they tried to actually shoot at the apes. Yeah. Zayas would have his hands full with that one. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yep. By the way, the question I have for you guys: Who makes this? Who made the scarecrows? Was it the humans I, or the apes? I huh. thought it was the humans. I, I assumed it was the apes. Okay. Interesting. Huh. Okay. I've I've never been sure about that, honestly. Yeah, because it could be either way, honestly. Like, uh, just just from the design of the scarecrows themselves, because um, they have they have like ape like fur on them. Essentially. Yeah, and, and right. sort of. And the reason I sort of thought it was the the humans was because of where they were crawling around on the rocks, following Taylor and the astronauts. Well, it's the edge of the forbidden zone. It's the edge coming of the forbidden zone. Yeah. So I'm thinking that they did it to keep the apes away from where they were safe. Hmm. meaning most apes that were exploring out that far wouldn't go into the forbidden zone and this was all the more reason not to venture any further but i could easily say see where it would be the apes doing or the apes putting up as a warning to apes to not go past that i I don't see the humans having the skill or the Hmm. awareness to to be able to or to understand (laughs) <laughs> to yeah, be able to do something too. like that to understand after, what they could accomplish by doing something like after that after all this mm-hmm. talk that's true too 
Little do we know, it actually says "Warning: Do not enter" on it. <laughs> they're all, they're in all AP, in APs. Yeah, exactly in in Aplish. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Except there is no Aplish, and this is this is a sticking point for me in the in, in mm. this the entire project of this movie because yeah. you know it's a chilling moment the first time we hear those guerrilla soldiers say "Smile." Yeah. And you know these are apes that can talk, but. Uh, I mean, are no warning bells set off in Taylor's mind that on this alien planet he's reached, <laughs> spoken the... and written language are exactly the same as the English uh, he knew on the Earth he left? I yeah. mean, this doesn't seem odd to him. It, that, that's a problem that the movie doesn't take adequate pains to solve or, or to explain. I do, I do think that, too, because <laughs> even... Even things during like the trial would not be called the same things as what Taylor would recognize, yet they are. I mean, no, I, I agree with you, Murd. It well, should have been just a little bit different. I, I mean, look, they were speaking Esperanto. Okay, it's it, it's <laughs> it, it's plain and simple. That's that's the only explanation. Is that it, the, the universal language? Everybody knows it. Boom. That's it. Or they're speaking English. But it's their version of English, which happens to be the exact same version of English as ours, because that's the way space. <laughs> uh, Star Trek lo logic. You're welcome. That's, that's that's my problem with universal translators. They're great, but yeah. the lips would not match. You would hear the right words, but they wouldn't match. Yeah, but they all match. Exactly. We should comment like the, on because uh, go ahead, Bert. I'm sorry, please. Yeah, I like uh, Douglas Adams' uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, yeah, the Babel the fish, telepathic fish that uh, just yeah. burrow into your brain. So it would probably alter your visual perception of the people talking to you too, so that you'd see their lips moving in tandem with the words that your brain thinks it's hearing. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. sounds yeah. One other thing I want to point out: we, we touched upon it briefly in the beginning. Is that what a merchandising phenomenon this became? Oh yeah. When, when we think about merchandising tie-ins, which we're so accustomed to now. Mm -hmm. I mean, this might be the first movie franchise where they really went all in on this. IMDb uh, calls it the yeah. major, first major large-scale yeah. merchandising tie-in. Um, books, records, comics, graphic novels, toys, yep. action figures, storybooks, like you name it. They, they had it, trading and cards. Especially in the 70s. Like I have my Me Gozeus here, which is obviously yeah. from the 1970s. But I mean, Marvel got the license to do their Adventures in the Planet of the Apes comic, yeah, um, which uh, was done in the nineteen seventies, and, and there's been apes at there's been apes licensing ever since. It, it waxes and wanes, but um, like Marvel just released a new. It's called I think it's called Beware of the Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. um, I read the first issue. It takes place right before this movie. It's excellent so far, and they actually incorporated some of the pages of the original Doug Monk George Tuska comics from the seventies into oh, wow. this comic. So huh. it's really oh, cool. That's good. Um, cool. When it but, comes uh, to the yeah, merchandising I mean, back then, ahead, did you. they have things like trash cans, curtains, and all that stuff like Star Wars really did get into? I don't know if it went that far, but I remember Jamie D talking fondly about toys he had mm -hmm. as a young boy. Um, like play sets. Like Miko yeah. did a lot of stuff. Like they had play sets, yeah, they, they sure had figures, um, and so forth. And uh, I, I remember as a kid – because I really got into this in the 80s. I was like, oh, I missed all this stuff because it wasn't around anymore. Um, but in the 70s, I mean, I, I mean, it was major, major tie-ins. So, you know, we, we think about how, how many of our beloved franchises in our, throughout our movie, movie oh. going life have become these yeah, merchandising, every, you know, juggernauts. Everything, everything from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves to Alien 3 and all kinds of stuff in between have toy tie-ins, whether they should or shouldn't. <laughs> I just I, I just found a fun photo of uh, of a uh, a seventies kid uh, at room with uh, uh, a whole bunch of Planet of the Apes wow. stuff oh, in it. That's yep. really aped out, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yep. So uh, is that Charlie McCarthy there up above the ape mask? I think you I think you might be right. And to the right. Yep. Oh yeah, that's Edgar Bergen with uh, Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. Good catch, Shane. <laughs> But yeah, this 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 one has uh, you know Halloween masks in there. It has Probably a Ben toys. Cooper mask, I'm gonna guess. Yeah, yeah. yep, good stuff, man. You know, uh, if I might, because I mentioned earlier on, I I watched 2001 because mm -hmm. it came out in the same year, just last a few days ago, and I had I hadn't watched it in quite a while. I read the book years ago as well. Yeah, um, and I just I just thought let's watch this because these are two huge science fiction films that have had a massive impact on our popular culture that came out, you know, the same year, 
I just wanted to have, I, want, I want to see what my reaction. Have you guys all seen 2001? Oh yeah. Mm. Yep. I, I never have. I never oh, have. Ian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I won't, I won't spoil anything, but you know what? I, in watching 2001 again after a while, I mean, it's Kubrick and I love all his work. I mean, technically it's amazing. Like when you think about when this, that movie was made and what they achieved in it, um, it's, it's stunning. I have and, to admit, though, and terrifying. Yet yes, another terrifying. It is terrifying, film. especially the latter part of the movie. Yeah. Um, but I have to admit, though, Planet of the Apes affects me far more mm-hmm. than emotionally than 2001. Um, and I won't give it away for, 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 for Ian, but I, th- th- to be honest with you, I've, I've steered clear because people that I that I know and respect have basically told me it is a slog. Uh, and, and I and pretty I, slow. Yeah, yeah, it's very it's a, slow. It, it, it's but, slow, but but it's it's still worth seeing. Oh yeah, yeah, and, I'm sure. And I also think the 2010 sequel is extremely worth seeing with Roy Scheider. Well, the 2010 sequel is just a very linear story. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't and, even know Roy Scheider made a sequel to 2001. Oh yeah, That's, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It came out in the 80s. I, I listened to it. Great cast, John Once a month. in it. Mary, yeah, yeah uh, Helen Mirren. Helen Mirren's in it. Yeah, um, it's called 2010: The Year We Make Content. Yeah. Yep. It's, so, it's fabulous. I huh. just fa- I just found that in watching 2001 again, I'm 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 just in awe of it visually. Like it, it's an amazing film. Yeah, like, it's it an really amazing is. achievement. Yeah. Um, the story is interesting, especially as it you get to the latter part. Um, but it just doesn't affect me the same way Planet of the Apes does. Um, mm-hmm. it, just the the way the film ends, what well, it's tr- what I think it's trying to say, it, it's just. It's, it's not lot, as enga- it's not as engaging to me. Yeah, it's a lot more abstract, and it leaves mm-hmm. a lot of questions unanswered, and you're never going to get those answers because even even the sequel, you get some. But yeah, you still don't get the answers to certain things, and you're just you have to accept it the way it is because if you don't, too bad. Like, yeah, it, it's definitely different than Planet of the Apes. But but it's interesting that in in that year, I mean, 1968 is a very you know, divisive year in our history in general. Mm-hmm. But to yeah. have these two films come out, like I imagine being like a sci-fi fan in 1968, man, that must have been awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to bring up, I'm sure Shane Ramones, is they also made a Planet of the Apes cartoon. And TV oh, show. And really? TV show in the 70s. Yeah. With Roddy okay. McDowell in it. Yes, yeah. Roddy McDowell was in the TV show as well. Yep, yep. Um, so I had one season, I want to say 1974. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sounds right. and the, the cartoon right. would have been the following year. I think. Yeah, and the cartoon, the apes have vehicles like they like they have like they look like the, the apes in the movie, but they have like jeeps and you know. And was the cartoon filmation? I have a DVD of it somewhere. I don't remember. It was the De Patty Freeling Studio, was it? Okay. Which okay. eventually developed into Marvel Productions. Okay. Yeah, because like looking looking at the animation for this. Um, it looks a lot like the animation for the for the Star Trek animated yes. series. Yeah, it and is that's what I was thinking. That. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't watched it in decades. I should I should pop it in because uh, you know that I, uh, this yeah, is fresh. God. I I don't know that I've ever seen it hmm. past like the seventies and eighties. Yeah, but the, I've never seen it at all. The fact that you that it shows you what a cultural phenomenon this came that they had a television show, they had a cartoon. Yeah, I, I mean. The seventies was just we we went ape. Nineteen seventies. <laughs> well so, said, my friend. Well, 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 well said. There it is. And, and also, I do not like these designs at all. <laughs> <laughs> these are nightmare fuel. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the shadowing is a little heavy. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, and and just like I don't know, just the the humanoid ape design is like taken to like the nth level here with this animated series. I, I they you know, actually I, look more like masks here than they do in the movie. Yes, that's a that's an excellent point, Shane. That's an yeah. excellent point. That is a dude wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we we have an obligation to our audience. We should briefly contrast this with the Tim Burton film. Hmm. I would have. I would if I'd seen it. Uh, okay. Which I have a love hate relationship with that. I think it's dread. I think it's dreadful. Yeah, oh, it is. It's, I think it's, it's more terrible. hate than love for me too. Yeah, it's but terrible. It's, but it's got its good it, points. I mean, it, yeah. it drives home a little more clearly than the original did. Uh, the, the whole cast system thing. That's yeah. true. That's looking true. At, I was barely aware the first couple of times I saw this that I was looking at different species of ape. Yeah. But uh, that was more clear in the, you know, the the visual effects and the makeup effects in this this 
in in the in the remake, and yeah. also the, the the contrast of the, the the gorilla warrior military cast and the right and the scientists as the the subalterns, I mean, the chimps as the subalterns, and the orangs as the scientist statesmen, what have you. Um, but yeah, that's about the only thing I can say <laughs> for the remake. There, I, there's there's some things where I think it could have been saved if they would have written it a little bit differently. Like I forget what the what the chimpanzee's name is in the beginning that Mark Wahlberg is training. Oh right, yeah, but I don't remember either. There, there's parts of that 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 come through at the end that were so stupid that if they would have changed the story just a little bit, it would have made so much more sense mm -hmm. for I what remember, they were making. I remember being so excited to see yeah. this film. Was it 2001? I want to say it came out. Uh, uh, yes, 2000, 2001. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I remember leaving the theater so disappointed. Yeah, going. I just, what I, the hell did I? I just, just found the, the script was so flat. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you had good actors like Helena Bonham Carter was Zira. Mm -hmm. Tim Roth was the I think the Gorilla Warlord. Uh, Helena Bonham Tim Carter was in a Tim Burton movie. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. You know, they had Heston and Linda Harrison come back for cameos. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there was a lot of interesting stuff in the mix but it's sometimes like it's just some movies like just the end result is it just doesn't come together and i I, I don't know if this is the case all the time but i've often find that when tim burton adapts other people's stories for me they're just not as compelling as his own stories when he makes movies yeah um and for, like i i saw outside, this outside of that one time with like that bat character that yes, uh, mm -hmm. yes yeah. so that's fair yeah. but yeah yep. um <laughs> good point brilliant but uh i i saw this movie once i never wanted to see it again yeah, I've watched it a couple times, um, yeah. partially because I kept hoping it would get better, and it really didn't. <laughs> but the new films that Ian referenced at the beginning of the sh there's been three of them so far, and there's a fourth one coming out. I've enjoyed them thoroughly, and like I've like seen... Mert said, they haven't tried to replicate the original series, but as you follow the story. They're moving. You can see them moving in a way towards the world that you see in the original film. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, they've had great actors in it. I mean, Gary yeah. Oldman, uh, Woody Harrelson. Uh, I mean, and and um, Andy Circus. Andy Circus is amazing. As oh my god! Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So yeah. Th those those are I I recommend. I just I just watched it because I'd never seen it, the the last one. War War for the Planet of the Apes, which was excellent. I've only ever seen the first one. I saw Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Oh, yeah. with James yeah. Franco. I, yeah, I yeah. think I'm. Same I here. think I've seen that entire one once. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, I've really enjoyed the story they're telling in the, in, in, in the new films. Um, you know, obviously the motion capture of the apes is amazing. Mm -hmm. But without spoiling, like you know, there's. The, I'm, I don't know if you guys have seen the trailer for the new film. No, I, have. I haven't. Um, there's a new trailer. Yes, but you know, they're clearly continuing to build that world. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's there's been there's nice callbacks to the original and in certain ways, some more over it than others. But um, I, I've really I've really those are I think those are good movies. I've, I've enjoyed them. Now, yeah. Not that I can't look this up, but how much time passes from that first one with James Franco to now? I think it's from the first to the second film. I want to say it's is it decades well, something like that. Here we are in Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, just going off of the Wikipedia. Entry. That's the new one coming out, right? That's the new yeah. one that's about to come out. Is three hundred years after the events of War of the Planet of the Apes. Wow. Oh wow. Okay, so they're really yeah. jumping ahead. Okay. Okay. So, wow. so we are we are definitely in desolate. Uh, you know, apes are ruling society at this point. Right, because the the first three films. You know, Caesar is the main character in all those movies, so it's following his lifespan. Uh, remember the first movie? He's, I think he's, he's a child, isn't he? Caesar, like a, a, mm -hmm. a yeah. child in the first one. Yeah. yeah. And then you see him as an adult and as the leader in the in the other two. Yeah. So, okay. Um, I, I didn't realize it was that far ahead. Okay, that's great to know, Ian. Yeah, they're they're definitely jumping very far ahead with uh with with this with this one this time around. Yep. And that comes out on May tenth of this I'll be year. There. Hmm. Yep. I'm gonna catch to, up. I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna the have to try. Yeah, I'm gonna have saying. to try to catch they're, up. They're, they're, I, I, they're worth seeing. I, I, I've enjoyed them. Yeah. Um, Some other bits of trivia, gentlemen, that you may appreciate uh, from uh, from this uh, Planet of the Apes that we were discussing. Um, number one, uh, one of Ingrid Bergman's greatest regrets, yes, yes, is that she turned down the part of Zira. 
um, and uh, she she let her daughter, you know, Isabella Rossellini, know it, um, and uh, she she would have loved it in the end, and she turned it down at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and then on a, on a related note to Zira, um, at a test screening, the actress who did play Zira, Kim Hunter, went up to Charlton Heston um, and asked how he was doing. And uh, Charlton Heston didn't recognize her because she he'd never seen her out of makeup. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Well, the that. make the makeup application was so involved that once it was on, they couldn't take that off during the day shooting. They had, yeah. in fact, they would have to um, when they would break for lunch, they'd have to sip everything through straws. Yep. Um, like if everybody smoked back then, so they'd have like cigarette holders for the cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Even the, um, even the apes smoked. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh man also this one this one sounds too good to be true but i really hope it is Pro- producer arthur p jacobs enlisted several journalists to play background apes this was a clever way of ensuring that they would write about the film I, I can see that yeah yeah <laughs> that, that, that's a, that's a top producer move right there yeah, i mean i know jacobs moved heaven and earth to get this movie made like it was it took it took several years to really get a green lit Excellent. So I did find it ironic. Well, not ironic, but interesting that uh, 20th Century Fox put this out too, right? That's what I kind yes. of thought that's what was in the beginning. Yep. I'm like, so they did this, and then 10 years later, they did Star Wars. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and the merchandising, baby merchandising yeah. uh, of, of, of those two franchises alone. Like, there's, there's a great skit of somebody. God, I can't remember who. I know this is totally not Planet of the Apes, but Star Wars, where they're talking about the 20th Century Fox people being excited that Star Wars did so well. And like, yeah, let's make a sequel. And some lawyers in the back going, um, yeah, we can't. We don't have the rights to that. Mm-hmm. I wonder wonder what how that felt with Planet of the Apes, you know, 10 years before. Because I know it's two totally different scenario, scenario situations. But did did they retain everything for all of the Planet of the Apes or did they just do the first one and then somebody else is producing the others i'm That's pretty sure they're all 20th century fox okay right i wasn't yeah. sure yeah i, I, I'm, I, I positive I, I, i'm 99 percent certain that they that they stuck with plant with uh with Planet of the apes throughout which, which then baffles me even more what they did with star wars because you took a chance with planet of the apes it did well you mm-hmm. made all these other sequels that were fairly successful you had mm-hmm. all this merchandising star wars comes along it takes heaven and earth to get that made yeah they finally do yet they relinquish the rights to george lucas because (laughs) they don't think it's going to do well and then he creates an empire a literal empire out of it well we have to remember though that that movies like planet of the apes 2001 like if you if you read like about the history of of cinema in, in, in the united states science fiction films would they would do well but they weren't you know like monster hits sure sure so like they, they 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 would do respectable numbers. I, I was just looking up here. I think Planet of the Apes made. I think I saw that it made like thirty three million dollars, something like that. Ian can double check that. But um, whereas, as you know, Shane, Star Wars was a whole nother level in terms of yeah the the the, 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 the profits that were brought in and and to- and and also getting it made was totally different than any other science fiction. Yeah. Space fantasy. Space, space fantasy space fantasy on a right, budget right, right. On, a, on a on a 1968 budget of four five point eight million dollars in 1968 money um it brought home 33.3 million dollars okay. in the box well, office. did quite well yes yeah. it, wow. it most definitely did like six times its budget yeah. yeah but that that's a that's a that's a dream for a for a movie but at the same time shane going back to what you're saying about star wars that all that also depends on who your producer is, which executive is seeing the movie, yep. how much faith they have in the project. Yeah, that's that true. Be, that could be as important as it is in anything else. And as as Chris pointed out, you know, there were there were producers that were trying to get this thing made for forever and a day that must have gotten the right ear for 20th Century Fox where they where they, you know, believed it. Just uh, like with Star Wars, George Lucas had the support of Alan Ladd Jr., who was yeah, and that was about it. Yeah. Getting that film made. Yep. Um, yep. There's always more naysayers than there are going to be people who are going to support what you your vision. Yeah. Um, and in, in both cases, we, you know, with both those franchises, we got, you know, these these are essential a- f- facets of our popular culture. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, Planet of the Apes. I mean, you know, the, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about 
I'm going to sound old now. I don't know about young people today, but <laughs> I mean, most most middle age older people they either they've never seen the film, they know they know the story, right? Like it, its impact, it, yeah, you know, it, exactly. Its impact yeah. is indelible. Yeah, and, um, and 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 no, that that that's that, there's no question about it. Everybody's heard of Planet of the Apes, even if they haven't seen it, they've heard of it. They know they know the cultural impact of it. They've seen a joke about it somewhere. They've seen an SNL sketch. They've watched The Simpsons. They've <laughs> you know, Letterman's referenced it or something like that. Like it's it, it exists in the in the pop culture zeitgeist um and it's never really going to go away so absolutely the case and let's talk for a minute about about the comic because there's a very robust comic world of planet of the apes so marvel got the license initially and they did the and he had the image up they had they did the adventures of the planet of the apes comic they also did a, a, some great black and white magazines mm. that doug monk wrote and mike kaluta drew if i remember correctly which are awesome visually they're really wacky like you have stories where like there's a, a talking human going on a raft with a chimpanzee wearing a davy crockett hat like all kinds of <laughs> wacky stuff is going on it's it's great 70s stuff um and then you had uh, other like uh boom did a great job with the lights they did a whole host of planet Apes comics more recently jason aaron wrote some of them if I remember correctly um that's good stuff uh, Marvel has now the license again. I, I love what they just did with that first issue of the new series. There's yep. been novels, all kinds of novels over the years. Yeah. Did Gold um, Key ever have it? I can't answer well, that. Well, Whitman, actually. like any of those sub sub comic. I mean, groups? those companies definitely definitely did licensed properties all the time. Um, but I I can't answer. I, I know Marvel. Had, I'm pretty sure Marvel had the first comic adaptation. They did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was definitely Marvel with the with the first, and now that it's with back with Marvel, they're putting out a whole bunch of omnibuses of the of that original stuff yeah. with with full Marvel branding. Um, so and I'm sure they'll reprint the mag the black and white magazine uh, stories trade, as well. Just a trade, all I want's a trade. Actually, I'll be right back. I have something to show you guys. <laughs> Not an omnibus. Oh my god! Mm -hmm. What what what's that, Shane? You don't like big books? Not what, that big. What are, you, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'd, I'd rather have a trade too, Shane. Yeah. I mean, I'll take a hardback too if it's something I really love, but it's got to be reasonable. Oh boy, there we go. Yep. Oh wow. I, I so this, this, archive. Is, this is from Boom when they had the license. Yep. So this is reprinting all the black and white Marvel magazines. Oh, that's wow. Cool. That's really cool. So it's a beautiful edition. Um, I don't know if I ever saw that. Yeah, it came out. Let's see. Well, Boom doesn't have the license anymore, obviously, but... Yeah, yeah. Uh, 2017. Yeah. And oh, I'm sorry, it's not Mike Klug. It's Mike Plug doing the mm. artwork on the mm. stories. Okay, that is a different Mike. Yeah, sorry about that. You know, one of the great Marvel monster artists of the 70s. Doug Monk does the writing. Um, these, are, these are a lot of fun. So this is a ch cherished uh, collection of my library. And by, and by the way, uh, whether uh, I mean, I don't know whether or not they're going to be available on Marvel Unlimited. I'll have to check there because, you know, that, now that they have the license, hopefully these are also available on Marvel Unlimited. But anybody who still has a Comixology Unlimited uh, uh, on digital, uh, this uh, these archives are included as part of Comixology Unlimited. Um, so even though Comixology doesn't exist, Comixology Unlimited still does. Uh, and... <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's and that's part of uh, of that of that subscription model still. Um, so worth 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 checking out if you do indeed have that as part of that, because the uh, first archive is going for one hundred and thirty two dollars and ninety six cents right now. So. so on the Marvel Unlimited app, mm -hmm. Planet of the Apes five issue seri series from 2023. Okay. Um, Adventures on Planet of the Apes, 11 issues from 1975. That's 70s, yep. Okay. Planet of the Apes, 5, 4, 3, let's see, that's the 2023 ones. That looks like it at the okay. moment. So they, okay. they haven't put the black and white magazine stuff up yet? No. Just, just five issues that are most recent, 11 issues from Adventures mm -hmm. is, is all that's on there. But it's, okay. The magazine, you're getting um, art by Plug, Tom Sutton, Herb Trimpey. Mm-hmm. Frank Ciaramonte, Virgil Redondo, like it's this is good stuff from the series. Nice, nice. Yep, very cool. What was the magazine called? The magazine, I think it was just called Planet of the Apes. Okay. I'm not positive on that. I mean, I would think if I search on that, that's what would have come up, but that not only those two things came up. 
I wanted to touch on one last thing before we sure. get uh, get close to wrapping up. Um, the the censors at the time, because we we, we love we love censors, um, tried to censor "Damn you, damn you all to hell" at the end of the movie. They tried to remove it, um, and uh, they were able to argue that. Uh, the character was actually asking God to damn those responsible for the destruction of the word of the world to hell, rather than simply using the word's name in vain. <laughs> and, and, that's how, and, and that's how they were able to keep it in. Um, yeah, there's a certain irony to that, given the part that theocracy has to play in the story. Itself. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that this movie is technically rated G. Um, Ooh, when, wow. when I. Yeah, when I when I when I logged into Stars to watch it, um, it, it it specifically told me rated G. And watching that movie, that is not a G-rated movie. No, <laughs> that is not. <laughs> I think some parental guidance should be suggested there. <laughs> I agree entirely. Yes, and not not to yeah, mention that so, so much of it, so much of it would fly over the heads of even like a teenager. Quite frankly. Oh well, yeah, it it did me when I was watching it as a younger guy. Yeah, definitely. I'm part of me's glad I'm watching it as a nearly forty year old. You know that that uh, that I, I I get the I get the full scope of of being able to understand everything that's that's put before me. So I'm thrilled. This is your first viewing, and that's great. And I'm I'm glad to have seen it. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. So I, I may very well take the plunge and at least ch and check out the future ones. But um, either way, I probably am just going to watch. I mean, I, I will wind up watching the more recent movies um, to catch myself up in time for that that release in May one way or the other. So good stuff. Shall we rate, gentlemen? Yes, we shall. Freck and Swears. Shane, Freck and Swears. I give it a four. There you go. Murd? Five. I could not give it fewer. Yep, Chris. Oh, it's five out of five. Oh, my God. Me, I'm I'm giving it a solid four and a half. Uh, I I think I think it's pretty damn close to a five. There's a couple of instances where mouths don't move. That, uh, that <laughs> you know, so if there were a couple more mouth moving mouths in the background or or you know voiceovers and whatnot, then it would be a perfect five. Otherwise, four point five, and it deserves every single bit of that four point five. And yeah. Ian, why don't you preview your exciting selection for our next retro round? Okay, excellent. So our our next our next movie that we are going to be selecting here as part of our retro movie review. It took us a while to watch this one, otherwise it would have been timely for October, but it's still timely because there's a new movie coming out. And it's the 40th anniversary as well. And it's the 40th anniversary, I Ain't Afraid of No Ghost. Yes! We are, we are going to be watching the Ghostbusters, the original Ghostbusters, as part of our retro movie review series uh. here on Geek Speak. God, that's going to be a hoot and a half. God, Jamie and, <laughs> Jamie and Sonic, they could recite that back and forth together. Yeah. We can, can do that, too. invite Daniel Corsetto to be a part of that episode? Or, yes. Or Shauna, for that matter, or yeah. both? Oh, 100%. Absolutely. We'll put the feelers out there, definitely. I, I know we had mentioned the Danielle at your uh, at your uh, summer sojourn, uh, uh, Murd, that uh, that we'd be uh, hopefully putting the feeler out for her. So I, I would love to have her involved Terrific. with that. Yep, absolutely. All right, guys. Excellent job on this one. And of course, excellent job to you fine listeners out there at patreon.com slash comic geek speak for being a part of it as well. We really do appreciate you and wouldn't be able to do it without you. So thank you very much for all that continued support that you give. And Shane, over yes. to you. Yeah, I got to find it because <laughs> my phone updated and things aren't where they used to be. Over to oh. you in f a few moments. <laughs> oh, there it is. Figure it all out. <laughs> He Why do things like have to change? He looks like he's figuring... Exactly. Why do things have to change? Uh, All right. Get off my wall. All right. Here you go. Visit us at ComicGeekSpeak.com to send us an email. The address is ComicGeekSpeak at gmail.com to leave a voicemail. The number is 267-702-6642. Stop by TheComicForums.VanillaCommunity.com. Look us up on YouTube at YouTube.com slash ComicGeekSpeak. Follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Um... I'm going to have to include all the new stuff that we have for social media because I don't have that yet. So look, look it up there. Yep. Um, wherever Ian says. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes one listener at a time. Send in your model the merch too.
Broadway has everything. Oh, I love legitimate theater. <laughs> I love you, Dr. Zayas. 